Thank you very much, Mark. I, I, I fully recognize that I'm, I'm standing between you and your access to a coffee break. So uh, we'll, we will endeavor uh, to do our, do our very best to, uh, uh, to try to stay on time. That, uh, uh, yes, first off, I'd like to thank the University of Maine here at Orono for extending the invitation uh, to participate and our friends at, the, uh, at MITC. Um, I think that uh, having uh, organizations like that to bring people together, um, to have discussions, to develop uh, potentially evidence-based public policy in the long term is, uh, is definitely the right step for, uh, 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 for, us, for us to take. So um, this is one of my favorite topics about talking about the Maine, Atlantic Canadian, and the uh, uh, the relationships uh, that, that, that we've had and shared for, for so long. It really is um, indeed a, a shared experience that we, that we share more than just geography. We share the same history, same culture, heritage. Um, we all essentially have salt water in our veins. Um, and, for, uh, and, it's, it's, and we also know that uh, uh, we very much uh, share the same, um, the, same, the, the same economy. So just a little bit about what us and the organization that, that, that I work with is that the Atlantic Center for Energy um, is an industry association dedicated to the sustainable growth and economic development of the regional energy sector. And the word region can be very deliberately schizophrenic depending on who we're presenting to and what, and what the subject matter uh, itself is, but essentially we try to serve as a meeting ground between industry, academia, uh, community, uh, uh, and government both the federal government and the province, provinces sit on our board for us to actually have an evidence-based uh, public policy discussion. Um, we are funded by, uh, by industry uh, for the most part, um, and the companies that uh, sort of show up at our board meetings on, a, on essentially a monthly basis are listed on our website, and you can visit it there. So the term Atlantica was deliberately chosen um, because it was a little bit vogue at one time, uh, not so long ago, the North Miles is still here somewhere. There he is, huh? That uh, essentially what it speaks to is that energy investment is very expensive. Um, and so an investment within the energy sector, uh, given the, the magnitude of, of that type of investment, is that you need to think of both, you need to think of jurisdictions um, beyond your own. So. Uh, the sphere of thought that the uh, that, that our group tries to focus on, although uh, we were born in New Brunswick, we really think of all of Maritime Canada, all of Atlantic Canada, um, Maine, um, ancient New England, and also um, uh, very much even the Eastern Township type region that we would have in, in, in the province of Quebec as being a um, historical common area of, uh, of influence. And I guess just to illustrate really how um, energy really is a, a, a shared jurisdiction, and the assets are in fact shared. Is that um, uh, like the Irving Oil Refinery that we have in St. John fuels more than just gasoline in in New Brunswick or Maritime Canada or in Maine? Um, in fact, six out of every ten cars in uh, in Boston um, are fueled by gasoline produced um, in St. John, New Brunswick. So that's a that's really a, a regional piece of infrastructure. Um, perhaps even more so is that the Maritime to Northeast Pipeline is that that foundational piece of, uh, of infrastructure that brings gas initially from the offshore of Nova Scotia through to Boston has benefited every single <coughs> jurisdiction along that footpath, bringing natural gas to the region. Whether you are in Maine, whether you are in New Brunswick, whether you are in Nova Scotia, um, or, uh, or, or part of the Sox Nation just outside of Fenway. Um, so it's those type of investments that really do tie us together. I'd like to pick up maybe on a theme that was, spoke on, that was spoken about at our lunch break, is that there is a direct link between energy and economic development. So there's two ways that our center tries to think about energy itself, um, is that those um, opportunities that are created through the, um, the, uh, through the creation and investment of energy infrastructure. Um, and also understanding that having access to competitive, uh, competitively priced energy is absolutely vital to potentially your region's um, ability to compete in a number of different sectors. So there's absolutely a public interest in maintaining competitive energy uh, pricing, having a, a competitive energy pricing environment. 
um, and to really cut to the quick of it, is that competitively, competitive priced energy attracts investment. And high energy costs drives out investment. And um, we've, uh, uh, we, we've seen that type of discussion with respect to our, uh, our manufacturing sectors, in particular pulp and paper, and I'll have more to say about that in a few seconds. Uh, but this section was supposed to be touch about current trend. So here are some of the current trends that we would, might want to think about uh, with respect to the energy sector uh, as we go forward uh, in our region and in the continent and for the most part even in the world is that um, in our own region is that you should be thinking that there's going to be more reliance um, on natural gas um, as a source of energy, on hydroelectric, um, and, um, uh, and in a broader context with respect to a foundational piece of infrastructure um, with respect to our nuclear plant. Those are non-emitting, non-greenhouse um, emitting sources of energy. That is uh, uh, where most of our base load is apt to come from in the next number of decades to come. That means less oil, power generation, less coal. Um, there will be more reliance on renewables, as I would suggest probably more on small scale renewables. Um, and the one that is the most competitive at the moment is, is wind. Um, but uh, wind has, it, has its own limitations, um, and uh, I'll touch on that in a second as well. There will be more emphasis on uh, energy efficiency. I mean, the, the best way to drive up cost of, uh, your energy cost of your organization isn't necessarily fuel switching. It's actually to drive out even the consumption of energy um, in, your, in your whatever process or processes that you actually have um, within your sector itself. Um, that's going to be front and, uh, front and center, I think, uh, as, we move, as we move forward, as our economy is going to transition in order for us to be able to uh, uh, ma maintain our competitiveness. Um, and I guess an illustration of that is this. Um, everybody likes numbers, kind of, he's like. Um, so think of the number 100. 100 is basically the hourly wage that um, we would pay someone in Fort McMurray as a welder. We don't, there's other, other um, trades, but we use that as a placeholder for you. Um, then we can think of the number 40. That's kind of the average wage that we would pay on an hourly basis, maybe in, in New Brunswick, to perform the exact same function. All right? So think of the number 10. And that's kind of the hourly wage that we say for the same, same certificates, the same trade capacity, <coughs> from, a, from a welder perspective in Mexico. And then think of the number one. That is the same, um, that's the hourly wage that we would pay someone in India with the same capacity to build the same skills as that, as that welder in Fort McMurray. So we're not going to be able to get there only by just doing things cheaper, by doing things smarter. And I think paying attention to issues such as energy efficiency really is a, is a, is a right track for us to be able to go as a region drive up cost. So it's not just energy cost in terms of is how much you can actually eliminate your energy costs itself. Um, so going forward is that we need to be better able to optimize when energy con consumption should occur. That's smart, smart grids, smart appliances. So there's going to be some very interesting things that are apt to emerge as, um, in the, in the, uh, uh, as a coming trend. Um, investments in transmission that enable us to optimize the energy generating assets that we have in our own jurisdictions in our neighboring jurisdictions are, I think, is a trend that we are apt to see um, uh, soon. So I think the, uh, uh, the governor's office spoke to this next slide quite well, so we'll move on a little quicker if we can. But if Maine's objective really is to strive to provide um, its, its region with the most competitively priced energy um, possible in order to, for, to foster economic development and retain jobs, um, I think we, we, we would suggest not just in Maine, but in every jurisdiction, <coughs> that you're ultimately not going to be able to solve your problems on, in a vacuum. So paying attention to opportunities in your neighborhood might make some sense. Um, that uh, um, another observation that uh, many of us might have made from reading newspapers over the last number of years is that New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Quebec, um, um, in different ways, they've all expressed a desire to uh, to cooperate and coordinate their energy assets within the region. 
Now we do that for reliability purposes, but we really don't do it for generation planning or even for cost and avoidance initiatives. So uh, there's still more to be done there. And we've also heard um, sort of loud and proud um, that um, other, many jurisdictions have a desire to be able to, where they signal that they want to either collectively or individually develop energy exports to serve that energy hungry Northeast. Well, I'm not so sure how hungry the energy hungry Northeast actually is, and I think we're, we're gonna have to have some, um, try to take a look at developing more dispassionate evidence-based public policy for us to be able to make those, that type of determination itself. Because um, some things have changed. Um, a process that is underway at, at, the, uh, uh, at the moment in a vote taxi, just to go to conclude, is, uh, is a study. We all like studies, I suppose. Um, but uh, known as the Atlantic Energy Gateway. Um, it was an initiative where the four provincial governments in Atlantic Canada and the four utilities got together and they decided to sort of show um, uh, what the art of the possible might be if they operated more as one, one company, if you will, but more as, more as one entity in terms of where, where they could be able to glean some savings, some opportunities by having um, better integration. So they identified long-term resource and transmission planning requirements. Um, they identified the need whether for future energy corridors, um, or to augment existing transmission systems. Um, and essentially, even though the, the final report hasn't been completed, uh, this is what they have essentially learned in the near term, is that the export market opportunities that they would have in New England, or even, even in toward New York, isn't as large as we might have actually hoped or aspired it to be. Um, we also under understand is that as Atlanta, Canada, um, and Maine, at the end of the day, we're like 3.7 million people. We're small. I'm well in there, five minutes, either, so we'll be fine. Um, that uh, we're small, that uh, scale does matter, and given the size and the scale of energy investment itself, it just makes sense for us to make sure that we, we optimize the energy assets that we actually have, and what the energy, what the Atlantic Energy Gateway study is, is, uh, is signaling is that there are significant savings um, to be had in cost avoidance through better integration um, and optimizing existing assets that we would have on the ground. Now, integration really, really is code for more robust transmission and smarter transmission. And um, uh, so that's uh, uh, a finding that we see. That's my way now. Here we go. We press the next button. <laughs> There we go. Um, so the world did kind of change over the last number of years. In 2008, that with the economic crisis that we had, um, things really did change in the manufacturing sector in North America. Um, and there is a fair amount of evidence now that some of it's not going to come back in the same industries, the same sectors. So. That's one of, the, one of the findings that the Gateway had, um, had determined. Um, it's not necessarily pessimistic information or news. It's just that's going to be the new normal. And as, we, as the economy does come back, it's apt to look a little bit different. Even our own hamlet here in Atlanta, Canada, um, Maine, uh, and uh, with our brother in Quebec as well. Um, the world also changed from an energy perspective, too. And uh, a few years ago, we probably didn't see this coming, is that uh, 10 years ago, essentially no gas was produced um, in North America from shale. Today, nearly, uh, near, nearly a third of the natural gas that's produced on this continent comes from shale. It really is a game changer. The United States produces more natural gas than Canada does today. So things have changed. So. Given the access to uh, uh, natural gas that we would have in our region through our pipelines, um, natural gas will be the default instrument, what will set the, the, the price of energy um, in the near future, and it's more apt to be um, more cost effective than it had been um, in the past. Maybe some, some messages for, uh, 
uh, for the state of Maine itself, um, in our region at large. I think from an energy public policy perspective is that, uh, that the, more, the more that we can remain flexible to regional opportunities in our neighborhood. And I would suggest that uh, the characteristics of Maine's economy, demographics, and its geography, that it aligns better, perhaps, with its northern neighbors than it does, perhaps, with the rest of New England. As opposed to being Maine being at the end of the line, Maine really can be essentially the energy gateway for the, for the rest of the region. Um, and it's an absolutely vital link for the aspirations for those companies that do want to be <coughs> exporting into New England at some point in time, whether that comes from Labrador, um, the Lower Churchill Project, or, or through Quebec. Um, I'd also like to make an observation about regulatory flexibility. Um, I understand that there is an, an earnest debate to be had about having separation between your companies that own distribution and transmission and own generation as well. But I think having um, having more flex being more flexible to what the art of the possible might be might mean, meaning that if a company does have the pockets to be able to make a strategic investment that could drive down cost and energy in the state of Maine, that if Maine were to be able to have a very robust regulatory um, frame, uh, framework where they where, the, where those officials are professionalized and credentialized um, and keep their eye on the ball is that uh, I think there's an opportunity for maybe maybe to revisit that type that type of an issue. Um, it's an earnest debate. I can argue both sides of the equation for you, um, but I think it's one that might make some sense to um, to, to consider itself. Paying attention to op opportunities in the neighborhood, so I'll just pick up very quickly. Quebec's got an awful lot of energy dammed up um, in, um, in in the province. They have reservoirs of water that have like seven years worth of rain. They're one. Of, they're the like the eighth largest utility I think in the world. Um, so being, paying attention to what the what, what the are the possible might be in Quebec, I think makes sense. Um, at the moment, they have um, in their purview somewhere around over forty thousand megawatts worth worth of power. So. Um, if, uh, if Quebec has some desires to be able to ship into New York and Massachusetts, I think folks in Maine should be able to benefit that to some degree. Where did I do four minutes ago? Anyway. Um, also with the, um, if I could suggest that uh, uh, there's other players coming online as well. And in, Lab and in Labrador with the Lower Churchill Project is that uh, that's going to have more diversity of uh, sources of power of energy. And the Nalcor and Mara project um, uh, step makes sense for Newfoundland, it makes sense for Nova Scotia, and the extra 335 megawatts that haven't been allocated yet um, are, are only going to provide people in Maine with more, with more choice um, and people in New Brunswick with more choice. Uh, I'm going to go to my concluding slide to see if I, if I can get through that. There we go. Um, messages to conclude, one is that the economy and energy, they're very much interlinked. Um, that energy investment is very expensive, so it just makes sense for us to be able to optimize what we already have in our greater neighborhood. I think remaining flexible to regional opportunities may make some sense as well. Understanding that there are other models um, that might exist, that might be in the public interest, with respect to ownership of generation, transmission, and distribution. Um, that uh, integration opportunities and benefits definitely exist if we make the right investments with respect to a transmission perspective. But one slide that I did miss, and I'm gonna beg to say, touch on this one really quick, um, is that I just think it makes sense for Atlantic Canada, Quebec, and Maine to work more collectively together to address the challenges that we have in the energy sector itself. But you know what? All too often the discussion in Atlantic Canada and Quebec concerning the development of, of generating capacity focuses on the end markets of New York and Boston. And we spend very, very little time thinking about uh, what the needs, wants, and opportunities might be 
for those jurisdictions whose geography is required to enable such projects, um, they really don't garner the same type of attention. And I think that um, looking, ensuring that we have benefits on both sides of the international border um, indeed makes sense. So that concludes my presentation. And uh, we'll now open the floor to questions. To uh, any of the, of the three speakers or all of them. Uh, yes, sir. I would just ask each of the panelists to comment. If we only had the time and the money and the human resources to devote ourselves to one project that would really further economic development in the, in the cross border region, would you comment on what you think that project ought to be? I'll go with one. I'm a, I'm a little jazzed by the East West Highway and the concept of having multi use corridor. Um, whether, because the argument that's possible, whether you're running telecommunications lines, transmission lines, highways, goods, um, I think it's, if you're making evidence based public policy decisions, is that having access to robust transportation links strengths really does really strengthen your region. Canadian Hydro, no question. I mean, that, I mean, even if you get the multiplier effects of indigenous wood burning and those <coughs> kinds of things, the order of magnitude of strengthening for the economy and for business attractiveness, uh, I think that that's just a no brainer. I would say we'll do it all. Next question. From uh, Bipul and John Stefan. Um, <coughs> and also for the other panelists, um, you cited a particular. Um, that uh, suggested that there were eight uh, Quebec companies that had established FBI in Maine, but there were zero Maine companies that had established FBI in, in Quebec. Um, given the cultural, the historic, and, and certainly the heritage aspects of the relationships between the two, what do you provide for a rationale for that disparity? And is that consistent uh, in the Brunswick and Newfoundland as well? In, in,
prior to this, the fact that we're dealing with a much, a, a very small average size or pick They don't tend to, they can reach out within a region rather than go from it. So I think it's just the, the I don't think that's good or bad, the structural uh, And uh, I think the other, another thing is that our economy is weakened very strongly in the north versus the south. And so the, the area that would have natural propensity uh, is fighting to survive and we're undercapitalized north of Bangalore. Until we get that capitalization to go out and recapitalize travel and field. I think school companies kind of been the example where in the service sector, some of the bank areas, we're beginning to make inroads. Uh, uh, so I think it's more that we're seeing a contraction of our uh, manufacturing in that area. But the other one is that this, this interplay of natural resources and the exchange rates, where there's some advantages for both our side and the other side to have businesses on both sides of the border take advantage of that, to normalize that risk. Uh, to me, it's something we're pushing for here. And then we need to find the Lord for us. I wrote that down. The governor might like that too. North of May. North of where you're sitting. Yeah. yeah. Two thirds of you. Any questions? Back. Thank you. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Nancy Collins is here. The question is for, um, On the subject of the East-West Highway, I mean, some of you expressed uh, a lot of interest in it. I, it's clear how, how it might benefit uh, parts of the Brunswick, parts of Quebec, particularly around Montreal and, and northern uh, Maine. But do you see spin-off effects for other parts of Quebec and other parts of New England from that highway, or is it, do you see it as more of a focalized uh, benefit?
this game when 30 years ago I went to Alaska from Bangor Hydro, and uh, the head of my advisory group at Entrepreneurship Center was Wally Hickel, and he took me to the window, a penthouse window, looking out over Cook Inlet, put his arm on my shoulder, we looked at Mount McKinley, and he said, young man, do you uh, realize that if we put a tunnel under the Bering Straits, we could run unit trains from London to New York? And I, all I could think of at that time was I'd never heard one hundredths of a vision or a dream of that order of magnitude in Maine. And we're 32,000 square miles, same size as uh, Ireland, same size as North Island and New Zealand. Uh, we've got tremendous natural resource assets and opportunities. We're the maritime part of the climate, the Quebec part of the sea. And I think this is the kind of, somehow we've got to make a breakout strategy. That's one of the things the governor is really saying. He doesn't just want to focus on big companies and big things. He's very interested in the entrepreneurial, populist side of things, too. But he's really challenging John Matera and myself on how do we make that breakout strategy? This is kind of the thing that, and to me, the East Coast Highway is just an illustration of us, our, our ability to develop thinking of that order of magnitude. It could go for conservation just as much as East Coast Highway. So you're trying to mean thinking of balance? 